If you look online, you'll find all sorts of different recommendations for how you should go about measuring the temperatures inside a reptile enclosure, with some people recommending using temperature guns, other people dials, and other people digital probe thermometers. And within that, people recommend all sorts of different ways of using these instruments. This gets even more complicated when you start thinking about thermostats, as some people recommend putting the thermostat probe at the basking spot, other people putting it near to the basking spot but not directly there, and still other people say that you should put it at the cool end of the enclosure. So which out of all of these ways is the correct way to go about measuring temperatures? Broadly speaking, we can say that there are two main approaches to measuring temperatures, those in which people try and measure air temperatures using a dial thermometer or a probe, and those in which people try and measure surface temperatures, generally involving a temperature gun. Not yet considering which of these approaches is more appropriate, I have to point out that there is flawed logic in most of the ways that people try and measure air temperatures. You see, the thing is, the air temperature around all of a vivarium is probably going to be pretty much the same. Air is constantly being mixed around, and consequently, there simply isn't the opportunity for a temperature gradient to form within it. At least, not within that much space. This would seem to go against common experience, as a digital thermometer with its probe dangled near the basking spot always reads a higher value than if its probe is dangled in the shade. Remember that all the thermometer like this does is it tells us the temperature of its probe. Likewise, a dial thermometer or even a liquid in glass thermometer just tells us the temperature of the thermometer itself. Therefore, these sorts of thermometers only tell us the temperature of the air around them if they are able to equilibrate with it. Now, you will know as well as I do that an object absorbing radiation from a lamp or the sun gets hotter. You leave an object out in the sun, it gets hot. Simple. Hence, if you leave a thermometer near to a lamp or in the sun, it will be absorbing lots of radiation and get hot. Again, because air is constantly moving around, the air under a lamp or in direct sunlight is the same temperature as it is in the shade, and so we can conclude that the only reason a thermometer reads a higher value near to a lamp than in the shade is because it is absorbing more radiation. If you aren't quite convinced about this, consider the following situation. It's a sunny day and you sit a probe thermometer out in the sun, and it reads quite a high value. You then shift it a few feet under the shade of a tree and it reads a much lower value. Do you really believe that there is an air temperature difference in the space of a few feet outdoors between direct sunlight and shade? Not really. There is no way that such an air temperature gradient could be maintained. So, the different readings of the thermometer are a product of the amount of radiation it's receiving. So then, to measure the air temperature within a vivarium, we need to make sure that we position our thermometer such that it is receiving a minimum of radiation, and we can do that simply by propping it up somewhere in the shade. The crux of this is that all of those supposed air temperature measurement methods, which involve probes dangled somewhere near the basking spot, don't actually give us any useful information about the temperature of the air within the enclosure. Okay, so by this point in the video we've established that you can measure the air temperature within a vivarium using a dial or digital thermometer propped up somewhere away from any lamps, and that you can also measure surface temperatures using a temp gun. But which of these measurements are we actually interested in? The way to find out is to look at the behaviour of wild herbs. If they choose their basking sites depending on air temperature, then obviously air temperature is the measurement that we want to take, versus if they choose their basking sites depending on surface temperature, then surface temperatures are what we want to know about. As we have discussed, the air temperature is more or less the same everywhere, so clearly reptiles are not choosing basking sites based on this. If they were, well, the air is, once again, the same temperature in the shade as in the light, so they wouldn't bask out in the light whatsoever. 
With that being said, if the air temperature is above or below certain values, reptiles will stop basking altogether, either because the air is so cold that no matter how long they sit in the sun, they won't warm up enough to be active, or because the air is so hot that if they were to get any hotter by absorbing radiation, they'd be in danger of overheating. In effect, there will be a range of air temperatures within which reptiles will exhibit normal basking behaviour. Our job is to find out what this range is and ensure that the air temperature in our enclosure is maintained within it. So how are we going to find out what this temperature range is? Firstly, a little bit of groundwork. Different species will, of course, have different acceptable air temperature ranges depending on where they live in the wild. A reptile from higher latitudes will, for obvious reasons, generally prefer lower air temperatures than one from the tropics. Also, the acceptable temperature range is going to differ depending on the season. In temperate zones, the air temperature is higher in the summer than at any other time of year, and we should like to replicate this in captivity to facilitate natural changes in behaviour, like brumation. Conversely, tropical species are likely to prefer more constant air temperatures all year round. The simplest way of obtaining all this data is to look at what is published by weather stations. The temperature values given by such resources are accurate measurements of air temperature taken using, you guessed it, a thermometer in the shade, so they're pretty much exactly what we are after. To offer an example, let's look at weather data from Alice Springs in Central Australia to try and find out what air temperatures we may wish to offer a bearded dragon. The typical maximum air temperature during the summer is 35 degrees Celsius, and the typical minimum air temperature during the summer is 22 degrees Celsius. So during the summer, we don't want the air temperature in a bearded dragon enclosure to rise above 35 or drop below 22. In the winter, the typical maximum air temperature is 22 degrees C, and the typical minimum air temperature is 7 degrees C. So, during the winter, we don't want the air temperature in a bearded dragon enclosure to rise above 22 or fall below 7. Hopefully you can see what I'm getting at here. The specific air temperature actually doesn't really matter, provided that it's not out of bounds. Having just said all of that, I will stress that it would be favourable to use weather data from multiple locations in the natural range of a given herb species rather than just one when it comes to choosing what air temperatures we want. So for bearded dragons, instead of just using Alice Springs, we could look at a range of different places in Australia as well. I would also tentatively suggest that we should knock off a couple of degrees from what we consider the maximum suitable air temperature during the summer, simply because in the confines of a vivarium, a reptile is going to have less of an opportunity to dig a burrow and escape oppressive heat than it would have out in the wild. So to continue the bearded dragon example, instead of saying that 35 degrees C is a suitable maximum air temperature during the summer, we might say that 30 degrees is a better maximum. There's no harm in playing it safe. Having gone through the relevance and importance of air temperatures, we can now move on to discussing surface temperatures, and here we will see that the situation is more or less the same. If you think about wild herbs, they really don't seem to care very much about the temperature of the surfaces that they choose to bask on. You will see them basking on roads, on branches, on fence posts, on sand, on grass, on rocks, and so on and so forth. All of these objects reach different temperatures in the sun, so clearly the herps are not really bothered about surface temperature. Of course, they will avoid sitting on something which is really, really hot, or really, really cold, but that doesn't happen often. The conclusion is, surface temperatures matter even less than air temperatures. If you set up your basking site and leave it for a few hours, then you can come back and put your hand on the basking surface and it isn't an uncomfortable temperature, then that is probably going to do just fine. About the best thing you can do is offer a range of different materials for the animal to choose to bask on, as then it will be able to access different surface temperatures should it so feel. But with that being said, even my supposedly thigmothermic species, like my leopard geckos, don't seem to show much of a preference. Okay, so you're probably thinking I am absolutely bonkers at this point in the video because I've literally just said that air temperatures don't really matter and surface temperatures also don't really matter. So, just what? Well, 
if we look at wild herps again, we can find out what it is about basking conditions that we do need to replicate. It's the radiation. The very definition of basking entails sitting out in sunlight. In every single species which exhibits thermoregulatory behaviour, we see that they raise their body temperature by moving into sunlight and let it fall by moving into shade. It's not the surface temperature that really matters, and it's not the air temperature that really matters, it's the radiation. All natural radiation, UVB, UVA, visible light and infrared, can warm things up. Each wavelength has slightly different properties which determine how good it is at warming up objects. Therefore, if we can replicate the sunlight conditions a given herp species would choose to bask in in nature, then so long as the air and surface temperatures are not extreme, as already discussed, the reptile or amphibian will be able to thermoregulate precisely as it would choose to in the wild. I've already discussed replicating sunlight in another video, which I will link in the top right hand corner of the screen right now, and you can either watch that video now and come back to this one when you're done, or wait till the end and watch it then. Having been through this video and the other one that I've just linked in, you should understand all of the general theory behind heating and lighting reptiles and amphibians. Our goal is to set up our enclosures in such a way that allows these animals to thermoregulate as they would in nature, which entails keeping temperatures within generally suitable ranges and replicating sunlight. The other video I linked talks about how you can go about replicating sunlight, and so that leaves to be discussed how you're meant to go about controlling temperatures, and that will be discussed in an upcoming set of videos. So, with all that being said, I'd like to thank you very much for watching, because today I've been JTB Reptiles teaching you how to follow nature's example, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye guys!